Uh, against all hope, I had, I had two, two choices for titles, either against all hope or the other option was even Putin can go to heaven. Yeah. Even Putin can go to heaven. Oh, today, that was Romans 4. I know it was a whole lot of words. It's a bit confusing, but I'll summarize it for you very quickly, right? There's, there's a bunch of people saying that you've got to be a good person to go to heaven. You've got to be, you've got to be uprighteous like us, us Jews. You've got to be wearing the right hat, talking to the right people, doing the right stuff. Well, Paul gets his gloves on and he just smacks him one in the face, all right? That's what he's doing. He just takes the, puts the gloves on and just gives him a good smack in the face. <laughs> because the truth is we are all entitled to the blessings of God. doesn't matter where you've been, who you are, what you've done. It's about faith. And that's what we're going to talk about. I'm going to pray. We're going to run, run through what Paul has to say to the Jews. It's very contextual. I'm going to do my best to kind of not make it boring. Maybe I'll clap my hands. I'll do a dance. But it is a bit. And I had some of the oldies this morning kind of nodding off a little bit on it. So just, just be ready for it. Um, it's hopefully I've cut it down a little bit. Uh, and I got some questions. I'm going to finish with a couple of questions. The first one, I think I've got them on the screen. I do. What promises of God are we doubting? What are we, prom you know, we know these things that God says. Are we doubting some, all, or none of them? We're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk about what impossible thing of God do we continue to question? Maybe God said something about you in your life. Are you still questioning? Are you, maybe it wasn't for me. I don't know. And we're going to last, we're going to talk about who you've given up on. Have we given up on anyone? Someone we think that, it's just never going to get into the kingdom of God. They're just never going to get across the line. We're going to finish talking about that. But first, to the boring stuff. The background of what Paul is to say, has to say about in Romans 4, is God promise, God's promise to Abraham. 4,000 years ago. That's a long time, isn't it? 4,000 years old. Even Keith's not that old, all right? 4,000 years ago, it may well be an ancient promise, but it's for us. And for those who don't know, it was a promise to Abraham that his wife, Sarah, would have a child. Sounds all well and good, except they were pushing 100 years old. So this is an impossible promise. And also, not only would they have a child, but their descendants would be more numerous than the stars in the sky. Big deal to us. But to them, this is huge. In their culture, having children was the most important thing. If you didn't have children, then, then there's no social security. You, you had to have heirs. And the more you had, it meant the more wealthy, the more important, the more standing you had. So this is a really important promise. For God not to follow through on this promise would be really cruel. It would be horrible. It would be devastating. And the same thing applies to this gift of righteousness we talked about last week. Remember this righteousness I talked about. I gave you the example of the guy I had that conversation with on the beach uh, during those baptisms the other week, how he said that his goal in life, when I asked him, what's your faith? My goal is just to be nice to people, to be kind, to be a good person. That's, that, his goal is to be righteous. To be righteous is to live a moral and just life. And that seems to me that's what everybody seeks. Even Putin, right? I, I know it doesn't seem like we're on the same page and clearly we're not, but that's what they're seeking. They want to be righteous and it's for everybody. Now, Jesus promises this to us, not as a matter of how good or nice we are to our neighbours, but as a gift. It's kind of odd. It's as odd as this gift of a child to, to, to couple in their 100 years old. Now, for God to kind of not do what he says, it would be cruel. And again, that's what we're going to talk about. Now, these gifts are both, improm are both impossible. But what's the result of the promise to Abraham? 4,000 years later, I'm still talking to you about it. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Think about how good that is. 4,000 years later, this promise to Abraham that came true, his descendants, for we are counted as one of his descendants, are more numerous than the stars in the sky. This promise, it survived countless wars, devastation, devastation, destruction, disobedient people. I mean, their whole civilization was just smashed into the ground and then rebuilt time and time again. Yet this promise survives. Let's have a look. 
Romans chapter 4, verse 1. We're not going to do the whole chapter. I'm not going to go through it verse by verse. I'm just going to skip through a few bits that I think are pretty important to us. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the faith, to the flesh, discovered in this matter? So this is following on from last week. This really is a two-part sermon. It's following on from last week, this matter of righteousness, this thing that everybody seeks to be nice and live a right and just life. That's what he's talking about. If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. And that's, that's what people do. People who have this perfect lawn and the brand new RV out the front, they often kind of boast about their achievements, don't they? They think they're somehow working to a place of righteousness. Abraham believed God. What does Scripture say, though? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Firstly, the rabbis, the teachers of Jesus' day, they taught that their father of faith, this is Abraham, super important guy, they taught that his faith was just so great that there was actually a surplus of it, a surplus of merit that was available to his descendants. And it's, it's kind of like me saying that I am such a nice guy I'm so kind to my neighbours, always giving, always helping, always putting up with your crap. No, don't, am I allowed to say that from Pulpit on Sunday? Can I take that one back? But you know what I mean, right? I'm so nice and so good. It's like me saying that you're going to get into heaven because of me. I'm going to take you with me. You just, just follow along, do what I say. We're all going to, you'll just get in because of me. Well, it's, it's not true because A, I'm actually not a good person. Not when it comes to the standards that God sets for us. B, your salvation's between you and God. It's got nothing to do with me. And see, you don't need me, right? Righteousness, this thing everyone seeks, is a gift. You don't need me. But back to Abraham. The Jews were saying to the people, just work hard, everyone. Follow God's law, everyone. Just do what you're told. Live up to our good standards. And, and if you do, well, there's just a slight chance, right? a possibility that Abraham, our, our great father of the faith, he's going to give a little bit of his surplus merit to you and he's going to get you over the line with God. Now, I don't know about you, but this sounds like a horrible way to live, a controlling way, a manipulative way, which is exactly what they're doing with it. This kind of expecting everyone to be always striving, always bringing larger sacrifices, always giving more money to the church or whatever it is, always trying harder, never really knowing if you're good enough. Never really knowing if your destination is the good place or the weeping and gnashing of teeth. In fact, I'm going to say that it's pretty much no different to the typical person today. Pretty much the same. Like my friend on the beach we talked about last week. To live a good life, be nice to people was his words. Sounds great on the surface. Sounds like if we all just did that, we'd all get along peachy. How's it working out? The end of the day, people like him, people like that, may include some of us. Ultimately, you're forever living in fear that you're going to be made a hypocrite. All it takes is one more blow up, one more argument, one more failure, and your nice life is made a mockery of, and you are labelled a failure. We see it on social media all the time. I've done youth ministry. I see how often they delete their Facebook accounts and start over. But what's way worse is that this kind of working for faith, working for God's acceptance well, it makes everyone who's unable to work feel like garbage. If you've got an addiction that you can't manage, well, you're excluded, aren't you? If you've got a temper you can't control, then church is no place for you. If you don't have looks to die for, well, let's just say good luck, ugly duckling. <laughs> to all of this, Paul says garbage, garbage. Paul says you're laughed. Paul says you're included in the kingdom of heaven. You're accepted. You're loved. Not by how good a person you try to be or pretend to be or can make your neighbours think you are, but you're included because your faith in Jesus Christ. It's 
all about Jesus. But Paul says to the one who works, that's those who are still trying to be nice, those who try to be obedient to the law, if you think this is going to get you somewhere. Well, to you, wages, which is the gift of righteousness, the heaven, are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. Kind of thinking we can work our way into heaven, it's, it's arrogant, really. It's prideful. Because God is actually not obliged to do anything for us. And if we think we can work for it, well, then God owes it to us, doesn't he? It's like, a, it's like wages for a job. But God doesn't owe us anything. No matter how good we pretend to be, God owes us nothing. And actually, there's nothing we can do to make ourselves as good as God. To make ourselves good enough. But the alternative is to the one who does not work. So to all the bludgers out there, <laughs> those of us, we've been doing this for what, eight weeks, six weeks now. Those of us who could admit that we are sinners. Those of us prepared, prepared to say, look, God, I actually don't know. I don't have the answers. But instead, trust God who justifies and makes right the ungodly. And this is what Abraham did. And this is, this is the punch in the face. To them, their faith is credited as righteousness. This acceptance, this inclusion into the kingdom of heaven, it is a gift for those who are prepared to admit who they really are before God. Those who are prepared to let down the facade. And it, was, and it wasn't just Abraham who did this. Their, their great father of the faith. It was another great hero of theirs as well, King David. And that's who Paul turns to next in verse 6. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one whom God credits righteousness apart from works. So if God gives you this gift of righteousness, which is available to all who seek him, then that's a real blessing. If we could work for it, then it's not a blessing, is it? It's just, you know, there you go, you just get what you deserve. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. It's back to the stuff we did last week. This, this idea that we must work for our salvation, for righteousness, it's just garbage. Why? Because if we could work for it, it would be no blessing. We would not need grace. We would not need God's mercy. We would not need his love. And certainly it wouldn't require any trust or faith in God, a God who seeks to bless abundantly all those who turn to him. Jew, Gentile, you, me, this acceptance, this righteousness, this inclusion in the kingdom of heaven, it is for everyone who has faith. Everyone. And Paul explains exactly this next. Verse 9. Is this blessedness only for the circumcised? Remember, that's the Jews. That was their sign that they, that they believed that they belonged to God. So is this blessedness only for them? Or is it also for the rest of us? We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. So Abraham was credited as righteousness without doing any works. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? Ah, so if it was before the sign, which is exactly what he says next, it was not after but before. So this is Paul's final rebuke. The circumcision is, is merely a sign. It's, it's a membership ritual for the Jews. And it's got nothing to do with salvation or this precious gift of righteousness. And he proves his point. By showing that Abraham's circumcision, the sign, followed his righteousness. It followed his justification by faith. And if you kind of work out the dates in the scriptures, 13 years have passed. God has said, you are righteous because you have faith, you trust in me, you believe the promise that you're going to have children in your old age. 13 years later, he was circumcised. Which raises the question, why then is circumcision even needed? Well, it's not. And that's the punch in the face for the Jews. Let's jump down to the result of this argument because I don't think we really need to be convinced of this. We, we get it, right? It's self-evident for us. So we're going to jump down to verse 16. The therefore, the, the reason, the, what all this means. Therefore, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace 
and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring. What's good is the hope of heaven, the hope of eternal life, the hope of righteousness, if it, if it isn't guaranteed. What, what is it then? Not only to those who are of the law, that's the Jews, but also to those who have faith, have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed. The God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. That's what I'm talking about. I turn to your neighbor and say, that's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about. I don't want you going to sleep. Now, I know we've just done the exegesis, the hard bit, kind of what's this all mean in their context, but now we've got to kind of get personal and we've got to kind of maybe take a gulp. No, no, this is a message of hope. This is great. See, God gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Rewarding good works is nothing special, right? Anybody can do that. That's, that's normal. That's natural. That's what us humans tend to do. That's what a boss does for their employees. They reward their good work. But God, God, God gives life to the dead. God calls into being things that were not. This, this, this gift of righteousness, because it's a gift, it calls into being something that was not. We start to become different. We start to become more. We start to become like Jesus. Not because we're working for it, but because we already have received it. Our good works become a response to what he's done for us. All right, that's what we've discovered. What, well, what else have we discovered before we wrap this up completely? This, this salvation, this inclusion, this going to heaven as a matter of good works is garbage. Coming to church is not about being a nice person. Yeah, I did Peter's funeral on Wednesday and I started my funeral sermon. I said, I'm going to be provocative. Nice people don't come to church. That's how I started the funeral sermon. Nice people don't come to church. And, um, and they, I think they got it. You wouldn't believe the comments I had after that, after that message. We talked all about righteousness. Now, if niceness, if it was a desire of ours, if it was a goal in and of itself, which we tend to make it a goal, don't we? I want to be the, a nice person, a good person. Well, that has no hope. There's no hope in the rabbit hole that takes a person down. There's no hope in the, in the tribe where it takes our culture. Quite simply, none of us are good enough to be nice. We're going to muck it up again. But more importantly, this, this law-based salvation, do X, Y, then you get heaven, that was never God's intention. That's not what the scriptures say. Instead, what God is seeking from you and me, he's seeking the humility to admit that we don't have the answers, that we are sinners, that we actually need his help. And when we have this kind of faith, his inclusion, his blessing, it's guaranteed. Now, I'm probably teaching us all to suck eggs, right? You get it. I think you get it. But this next bit, I think it's gold. And it's going to wrap up our challenge in verse 18. Against all hope. Humanly speaking, there's no hope that Abraham's wife could conceive a child in her old age. Yet against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. He believed and the promise was fulfilled. That seems too easy. I have to do stuff, God. No, 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 no. You just have to believe. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. He's admitting who he is. He's admitting the reality of what his life, what's ahead of him. Because he was 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. She was beyond the age of childbearing. This is no exaggeration. They're pushing 100 years old. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God. That's what we have to do. Not waver. Even when you muck up, when it's stop and go, oh, I'm not good enough, God. The promise is there. The promise is yours. We must not waver. We don't need to waver. 
being fully persuaded that God has the power to do what he has promised. Okay, despite this impossible situation, Abraham praised God. He trusted he had faith. Did you notice that song before the sermon? I'm sitting there thinking, he's talking about the goodness of God, the goodness of God. I'm thinking, oh, here's someone who's lived a great life, had a nice time. I can bet you anything. Whoever wrote that song probably had a terrible, horrible life. And yet here he is singing of the goodness of God. There's so many great songs like that, like Amazing Grace. You know, these, these songs don't come out of a place of a perfect life where everything goes well. They come from a place of knowing you're a sinner, knowing God is good, and knowing that he loves you anyway. And it is amazing. It is very special. But I'm getting off track. Verse 22. This is why. Oh, yet he did not evade. When I go, verse 22. There it is. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone. So he believed that God could do what he said he could do. And these words, it was credited to him as righteousness, this this gift, this ticket to the pearly gates, this key that unlocks the door, was not for him alone. Wow. Abram's faith in the promise of God resulted in the gift of righteousness, this gift of of inclusion. Likewise, Paul makes it absolutely clear that in the same way, our faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ results in this blessed gift of righteousness. Don't take my word for it. Have a look at verse 24. But also for who? Who's it for? To whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him, and here he just gives a couple of lines of what we're on about, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins. We did this last week. The propitiation, Christ's death, takes our sin and shame into the grave. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification, and we are raised to life with him. It's all about Jesus. This world is broken. We are broken. And it looks like there's no hope. We see it everywhere. We see just around the corner a self-righteous Putin, a Hitler, world wars, famines, pandemics, family feuds, fights, marriage breakups, abuse, addiction, failure, depression, anxiety, so much sin. It is everywhere. No matter how good we pretend to be, it just keeps coming. It's just a wave and it just keeps on coming and there appears to be no hope for humanity yet God promised to save us he promised to make a new heaven and a new earth without all this junk I know it sounds impossible just like Abraham and Sarah having a child at a hundred years of age yet this is God speaking he does he can he will save us from this mess And all he asks is that we have faith. Wow, it's not much to ask, is it? But man, it can be hard to do. He doesn't even need us to be nice people. Right? He doesn't need us to be nice. He doesn't expect anything from us except our faith. Now, who's been praying for Putin? One of the ladies this morning prayed, I've been praying that God would remove Putin she meant it in a very literal kind of and when I said oh you should be praying for him to join us in heaven and she goes oh yeah I know that's a hard thought isn't it that's a tough thought I'm not sure I can pray that prayer I'm not sure I can but if God can include me he can include Putin Mm -hmm. against all hope If Putin decided to put his trust in Jesus as Lord and Saviour, if he said, Lord, take my sin, take my shame, make me whole, we would be in heaven celebrating with him. Now, is that a tough thought? My point is this. If God can save Putin, imagine what he can do for you. Yeah. All who have faith in Jesus will be saved. Faith that Jesus rose from the dead. Faith that his death 
puts to death the consequences of our sin and shame. Our good works, it's a good thing to do, but it's not ultimately going to make up for much. Our good works can never make up for all the sin in our lives, even if we tried. Instead, we must hope in what seems impossible, that God would save a wretch like me. Hmm. It is by faith we are saved. It is by faith we are transformed. It is by faith we receive the Holy Spirit. By faith we are made new. Let me close with those questions. What promises of God are you doubting? I've actually named a number of promises. Which one are you doubting? If you're not yet a Christian, perhaps you're actually doubting that God can save you. I'm hoping that doubt is now gone because look what he can do. Look what he has done. God, would, God calls us all into his kingdom. All are called, but few are chosen. And if God's pulling on your heart to answer that call, then you are the, that is a miracle, right? Don't let that miracle go. Respond to him. Have faith. And he will make you new. Now, if you are a Christian, perhaps you're caught up in guilt. Maybe your failures, you're just never feeling good enough. You're seeing other Christians in the church just doing so much. <laughs> And you're thinking, I can't possibly do as much as them. Maybe I'm not as good. Maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe there's a problem. Guilt is the work of the devil. Guilt is the work of the accuser. Because all guilt does is hold you back and hold you down. The enemy wants you to think you can't be used by God. You might be a Christian, all right, I'll let you get away with that, he says. But God can't use you. There's just too much muck in your life, too much trouble. <laughs> if God didn't use sinners to do his miracles, if God didn't use sinners to preach his gospel, to love the unlovable, we would not be here. There would be no church. And they'd just be static in this microphone. We must confess our sin to God. That's a daily thing for me. But I don't do it <laughs> to be accepted into heaven. I know that's already going to happen. I do it because I want to put that stuff behind me and let him change me, transform me, grow me into the likeness of Christ. Heaven's for you. What impossible thing of God do you continue to question today? Personally, God, God called me. He gave me a crystal clear dream that, that I am to be part of revival and renewal in, this, in the Newcastle Diocese, right? Clear as day. This renewal, I see it. I see it everywhere. I get it. It's great. It's wonderful. I see it. But ultimately, it's a matter of works. It's got to work hard, really. This whole church thing's not rocket science. You know, we can, we can do it in our own strength if we try hard enough. And our church will, will grow a little bit. It might reach out to community a little bit. But revival, that's just so big, isn't it? Revival, it's supernatural. It's public. <laughs> wow, imagine that. Now that I, I struggle with. That one I, I'm, still, I'm still hoping like Abraham did, but I haven't seen it yet. Imagine that though. That's one I cannot do no matter how many hours a week I want to work. I'm trusting God for it. Keep on trusting. But what about you guys? Is there a promise of God from your past that you've never followed through on? Has he done something for you that you just can't let go of? Like you just, there's a, maybe there's something someone's spoken over your life or you've read it in the scriptures and you feel you're meant to be fulfilling it somehow and you haven't done it, you've let it go? Or how about this? God says you're loved. Is anyone doubting it? God says you're his child. Is anybody questioning it? What God says to you is, Jesus said to the criminal on the cross, you will be in paradise with me. Lastly, who have you given up on? Who have you been praying for for years and years and years and years and they seem no closer to the kingdom of God than they were when you started? All right, there's, there's someone like that in pretty, I'd say, all of our lives. Keep going. Keep going. 
trust his plan because your faith may yet move a mountain. That's what Jesus tells us. Keep up the faith. Fight the good fight. Finish the race. That's what's in store for us. You're already included in the future kingdom of God. It's guaranteed. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter where you've been. All that matters is you have faith. Praise God. Let me pray. Lord, thank you. You are such a good God. It is a great mystery why you choose to include us sinners in your perfect kingdom. But we have hope. We have faith that you will make us like Jesus without sin, pure and holy. In Jesus' name, amen.